Let me hear somebody say, I got the joy in me. I got the joy in me. Come on, people, gather around. Help me make a joyful sound. Mama, daddy, girls, and boys. Help me make a joyful noise. Come on, give me a shout of victory. Overcomers and conquerors are we We gonna cast off the spirit of worry and doubt Lord, loose us tonight Cause it's time to break out Everybody say Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah I got joy in me Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah Got the joy in me How many got the joy of the Lord? your heart tonight. Now in Sunday school we used to go like this. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. How many remember that song? You remember that song? Lift your praises to the sky. We're gonna get down with some church tonight. We're gonna dance and we're gonna shout. It's time for commission. Give commission to him.
so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth To show the way From the earth to the cross My debt to pay From the cross to the grave From the grave to the sky Lord, I lift your name on
Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. And welcome back to the Word of Truth family, the Word of Truth healing and deliverance, Ministries International Bible Study. So glad that you could take a few minutes and set aside and stop by. Put your cup under the fountain. Let something drip in it. Get something good. Because it gets gooder and gooder and gooder and gooder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I see in the moment, yeah. And gooder. And while I'm at it, and while I'm welcoming, while I'm welcoming everybody, there are those of you that have contacted us on Facebook and on uh, on uh, email, and you're trying to get a link. You can find the link. This is the link. Write it down. One is on the website. The Word of Two Family has a website. It's called. Word of Truth Family, 79 at gmail.com. Word of Truth Family, 79 at gmail. You can find a link on that particular uh, page. To, to contact us and, and be live with us right here. Or you can go to my personal webpage. This is all lowercase lettering. Dr. D R F R A N K W I L L E T T at gmail.com. It's all one word, it's all lowercase. Dr. Frank Willett at gmail. And there's a link on the last page that says, contact us. It'll bring you right here. With that, I'm gonna ask our friend, Sister Judy, if she will pray us in, please, ma'am. Be so kind. I will. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight to thank you. We thank you for what you do for us. We thank you for this group that we have and all the people that it touches. We thank you for allowing us to meet again tonight and to be together. Lord God, we love you, we need you, and we do call upon you in prayer. Please be with everyone that is within the sound of my voice. Be with them, hold them in your loving embrace. You know their needs, and I know that you will tend to them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Well, John, we we'll back in another week again. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. It must be weighing you out. Oh, well, but nevertheless. No. <laughs> uh, no, we just we're just very busy people. Well, and also, then yeah. also, if I could, I'm, I'm, I'll turn my camera on just one second. Well, that would be nice. Um, yes, sir. Uh, and uh, one last thing is that uh, you can uh, check us out live on Facebook on a few pages we have. We also have um, we have uh, um, Acts of the Apostles. You can go to the Facebook. You can type in the search when you can type in Acts of the Apostles or Understanding. Let me, let me back up. Understanding the Acts of the Apostles. It'll pull it up that way. It'll, you can type in understanding church history. It'll pull it up that way. 
Uh, you could type in uh, Faithquake. That's another one you could type in and take you to that one. You could type in my personal page, do that way. You can go to me on my actual Facebook page and go there. There are so many different ways we put this out there for, for folks to come in. And if you would like to be a part of it, like Frank said, you can send us a message and request to send you a Zoom link where you can actually come in on the Zoom and be a part of us here in the group. And because uh, when we get done with the lesson, we give everybody opportunity to speak and share what uh, the lesson did for them and uh, what God spoke to them regarding. And it's usually a it's usually a big blessing to to hear what everybody else has to say. And, uh, you know, not just me, you know, I'm, I don't have not the only voice here. So, uh, but I think it's a great idea to have opportunities more to come and like and share. That's another thing. Uh, get the word out. Let, let folks know that, you know, we're studying. Uh, we get done with this. We're going to, um, I'm really praying about it. And we're going to jump into the other books that our study in Acts doesn't cover. Let me, let me kind of give a little foreground. We, we took upon ourselves to study the book of Acts as like a master's class. For example, many people don't get an opportunity to go to seminary or Bible college, and they would like to, and they don't know how, and they can't afford it sometimes. And it is, it is it's very expensive. I got, I got, I got plaques and degrees on my wall that, you know, uh, they, they weren't, they weren't cheap. Um, and I didn't go buy one just so I could have a plaque on the wall. I went to school and I've got tons of books. Frank's been in my home. He stayed in my home. He knows what he's, he's seen my library. And, um, you know, I've got, you know, tons of books from all the seminary, not only that I went to school with, but the two seminaries that I actually taught in. So, um, you know, I take this information and we made a point when Larry Johnson was alive before he passed away. And uh, knowing he's up in glory, but um, the when we took it upon ourselves to, to take on Acts, I asked if we could present it in a way like you would in a Bible seminary kind of a way, um, meaning that we study the Acts in its depths. We study the Acts in the reality of how it is and what it was given, how it was given, and the chronological order as it's pre being presented. So when we came to the time in the book of Acts, when, say, the very first epistle or first writing of the New Testament that was written, which was the book of James, um, then we actually read the book of James. When it came time when Paul wrote the letter to Corinth, the first and second one, we took two nights and read first Corinthians and second Corinthians. Now, I know a lot of people might say, well, that was awful long to read the whole thing. It was just a letter. Them cats sat and read that thing, you know, and, and got all they could. They could gobble it up. They wanted more of it. In that day and time, they didn't have, you know, you know, Facebook and YouTube and all your other social medias and platforms and all your internet and, and all the things that you could do and Google this and Google that and find whatever videos and stuff that you want to watch or see, or that you don't like, you can disregard, or look over it, or ignore it, or go to the church you like this week, or go to the preacher you like to listen to this other week, you know, we, in a world that we live in today, we can just pick and choose whatever kind of Christianity we have at our beckoning call, but in the time of Christ, and in the time of our study here in Acts, looking at the life of Peter, looking at the life of Paul, both of which were men who were one coming from a very religious background. See, if you think about Acts and how Luke presents it, Luke presents it from two sides of the same coin. He presents it Christianity of two men. One faces illegal legalism, where the other one faces freedom. Paul is that that comes from the Pharisaic background, where Peter comes from just a blue-collar job kind of a person background. He's just an average guy. So you have these two facets of Jews in that day and time when the book of Acts, when Luke writes it, and he's writing to Theophilus, the bishop of Antioch in Syria, who, by the way, was a Sadducee, someone who didn't believe in the hocus pocus or angels or, or anything that had to do with anything like kind of real spiritual. I mean, they were the, you know, they were the, 
biscuits or gravy kind of a guy. You know, they didn't they didn't go with all that ham hock and bacon and you know stir fries and you know they didn't know they just wanted just what the the crux of the matter and that's all they needed that's all they wanted and that's what that's that is theophilus's background he's not privy to a lot of the spirituality things like angels and stuff like that so luke who is a physician a surgeon is going to write the second letter his first letter to theophilus which what we call the gospel of luke and the second letter which is the acts of the apostles is Luke's second letter. So we took it upon ourselves, got together. I think what we hashed over a couple of days, right, Frank? I think it was. It um, was about three days. About three days, maybe it was. That you know, we all kind of just sit here and, and chewed on it a little bit. And and I made the presentation that that if, if seminary could ever teach, if I could ever take seminary and bring it to you and let you take it free of charge, then I would bring you the seminary that Christ would want you to have the seminary that would be him talking and not people's ideologies, not people's uh, free thinking, their perspectives, offering their objectives or agendas, uh, the reality of letting the gospel speak for itself. I don't know about you. I, for one, would love to have a study, a Bible study, a group of believers gathering, whatever you want to call it people of God to actually listen to what God said and not allowing tradition and the mindset of denomination to force you to believe it their way or else. Now, and while you at it, go ahead, sir. Let me interject and I'm not trying to interrupt you. You know, uh -uh. but we have been in this particular book 22 months. Yeah, for a long time. We have been here for some days. We've been we've been going strong like this for 22 months, and we're getting more people every week that are, that are listening and look. Oh, excuse me. Oh, oh, you enjoy that? Oh, oh, that was, it was good. I <laughs> My mother would have said, puke the next time we'll fight over the big piece. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> See? Yeah, John. Uh, we just, we just, we just get, we just, that's who we are. <laughs> uh, Take it away, John. You know, and let me also say this, and, and um, um, in regards to bringing and presenting the book of Acts um, in this study and the way we're doing it, we're doing it on a master's level. So you're getting this information just as if you were really in seminary. You're getting this as the as if though you were actually sitting in class, and we we treat it as such. Um, that we actually dig into the details. We get into the Greek language. We get into the the Chaldean language. We sometimes the ancient Aramaic language. We will dive into certain realms that you know. If you think about the perspectives, we put it in context. There are certain things that we do and and um uh my publisher is actually right wanting me to put this in a book form a text form to be presented to anyone to take and use anywhere they wanted to and make it you know just a textbook kind of a thing i don't know we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get there but um we're we are closing in on the on the end of acts we are now uh, at the end of the chapter 23, we're going to be going to course 24. Um, you're going to find some things that are going to be said that in a traditional sense, you may want to think, well, you should be talking about this or you should be talking about that. Well, we must put ourselves in, into the context of scripture, meaning we must look at the surroundings for which the letter was written, for which to whom it was written, why it was written, and what are the circumstances surrounding this? What were the circumstances surrounding Paul's life when he was in Ephesus? What was the circumstances of his life when he was in Philippi? What was the circumstances when he was in Colossae, when he was uh, traveling across over to Phygeria, and all these all these different places, and what was, what was the, the people that was walking with him, the ones that was traveling with him? What about them? Uh, you know, we, we see all different things 
that sort of add to that build the reality of this scripture and we don't sit here and make it pacifying where it's you know well we're just going to read so much you know we you know we did real good because we got two chapters done no, no none of that it you are doing you the the word of god a disservice and you are cheating yourself from the values and the beauty that the scripture holds for you by just skimming through it and well i got through it and i read this and i read that you know um so we really take our our study very seriously so i just wanted to throw that out there for you for what it was worth let me uh get uh my the actual right one i'm actually doing both of the studies tonight and tomorrow nights and i was working on it while the music was playing um let me share this passage this right here for you so you can see it let me know do you see it no mm -hmm. yeah i see it you do see it okay all right hold on um no you don't see it no okay uh let me try something else here hold on uh, new share. What do you know? Ah. Okay. All right. Very good. So let me get things now. Um, tonight a little bit different. I want to uh, dive into something a little bit more interesting with you. Um, you do still see the screen, yes? No. 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 Okay. All right. Hold on. I know what I got to do. Stand by. I am this this has been a, a interesting thing for me to learn. All right, so uh let me I want to bring us into the mindset of tonight. This is real important. Tonight's lesson that we're going to learn is uh is is really going to be a a very deep um presentation. With that said, I really want to be able to bring you a a um, how can I say this? A a real truthfulness to hearing the sounds of of the time. Okay, so um, let me get to let me put some music in the background to kind of get us in the mindset of the Jewish realm, the realm of Rome, the time that we are thinking about and working with. I want to really give you the motif tonight because this is one of the most pivotal moments in Paul's life. God came and visited Paul in prison just a few days prior to what we're seeing and experiencing here tonight. So Paul has already somewhat gone through some semi-trial, if you will, by his peers of the Jewish folks. And the Roman guards had come and had protected him. The centurions had come and, and guarded the situation, had given even Saul the opportunity. And when I say Saul, I'm talking about Paul. But he was a Jewish man named Saul. To say his name in the Greek would say Paul. God didn't change his name. He's still the same guy. When God kicked him off his horse. He didn't say Paul, Paul. He said Saul, Saul. God never changed his name. His name is still Saul. It's how you say his name in the Greek language, which is Paul. And so that being said, um, Saul was given opportunity to make a speech to the peers of his Jewish brothers, and yet they still come back to haunt him. And then he got uh, was getting ready to have to be uh, taken to prison or taken to the uh to the fortress um their uh, fortress at antony the time or the place which is right beside the uh the temple and it's where the roman guards would have been there and there was a plot to kill saul by the jewish people the rabbis the jewish leaders the church of the day Saul was, was, there was a plot against him and his own nephew came and brought the information to Saul and Saul was able to get the, the soldier to let the commander hear what the young lad had to say. And then now we are looking at a 
time where he's going to be sent to Felix. Felix is the governor of Judea. He is the guy who takes Pontius Pilate's place. So you can understand the reality of and the, the seriousness of Felix. Felix is in Caesarea. He's not in Jerusalem like Pilate was. So we're going to see this unfold here for us. We're going to see where these the, the plot that continued to rival and uh, rise above to kill the apostle. But God promised him and came to him in a prison and uh, told him he was, he was going to go speak the word in Rome. God gave a promise. I, you know, we can say a lot of things about this, that, that God used the time to, 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 to show his sovereignty in and among not only the people, not only among Paul or Saul, but as well as he did among the Romans, he showed his sovereignty. God said he wanted him to go to Rome to preach the good news. Now, if God gives you a word and tells you he's going to do something, you can rest assured that's what's going to take place. And so after the visit that he gave him in his prison, Saul is now going to be put in captivity or in prison to go now and be transferred to Caesarea where he will meet up with Felix and have the trial because he's a Roman citizen that he begged for. So, sis, if I could get you please to read for us there. Uh, this is going to be talking about, this is verses 23 through 35, and I'll follow along with you on the screen as you read. Okay. And he called for two centurions saying, Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. He wrote a letter in the following manner. Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. The next day, they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. When they came to Caesarea and had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor had read it, he asked what province he was from. And when he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers also have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. Well, he's getting, he's basically staying in the king's suite. <laughs> no. I mean, you know, he's, he's, he's having an opportunity here. Now, Saul, Paul, as we're going to call him, was moved to Caesarea under the control of Governor Felix and was escorted by an armed guard of almost 500 Roman soldiers. You catch that? Until it came time for him to depart from Rome, though, he would have to be held in some secure place so there and in this place at Herod's Praetorium. Both the conduct of these secular authorities and the subsequent dissemination of the good news reveal obviously God's sovereignty taking effect here. We can look at this and see the sovereignty of God in Paul's life, in Saul's life at this moment. Now, let's talk about Felix for just a minute. Who's Felix? Who is he? Felix was the governor of Caesarea. He's, that's where Paul was kept in custody while he was on trial, by the way. Felix was well acquainted with the way, or Christians. He was not a Jew, but he knew the way, the Christians, and had rather accurate knowledge of it, actually. 
Antonius Felix, possibly Tiberius Claudius Antonius Felix, who was born in Circa at 510, um, was the fourth Roman procurator of Judea's province from 52 to 60 AD in succession to Ventidius Cumanus. Felix was the younger brother of the Greek freedman Marcus Antonius Pallas, and Pallas served as the secretary of the treasury during the reign of Emperor Claudius. Now, there's a lot of names being thrown at you there. I get it. But Felix basically was a Greek freedman. Now, either of Claudius, the Jewish historian, by the way, historian Josephus, referred to him as Claudius Felix, or basically Claudius's mother, Antonia Minor, who was incidentally, by the way, the daughter of Triumvir Mark Antony. You've heard that name before, I'm sure. And to Octavia Minor and to an aunt of Emperor Augustus. Now, these are all names you probably may have studied back in your day in school. But with his brother's help, Felix was appointed procurator. Now, a significant rise in crime was seen in Judea as a direct result of Felix's brutality and his openness to bribery. You can go back to Acts 24 and 26 to see that. Internal conflicts, by the way, and uprisings during his time in power were very common but he dealt with them very harshly too. Since verse 23 and 24. And he called to him two of the centurions and said, get 200 soldiers ready by the third hour of the night to proceed to Caesarea with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. They were also to provide mounts to put Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. I have a map there for you on the left-hand side of her screen that shows you the driving distance or how far they was going to go from this point to that point, from Jerusalem, uh, passing through Antipatris and on to Caesarea. So this is the journey that they would be taking. Um, now, there's 470 folks. 470 were sent to protect him. There were 70 mounted troops. 200 foot soldiers and 200 spearmen and one prisoner. The commander did not want to have to defend the murder of a Roman citizen who was under his protection since he knew that the 40 assassins would fight to the very death. But the lengths to which the Romans went to defend Saul were more than equal to the passionate determination on the part of the Jews in the ambush to murder him. Now, on the other hand, Saul was probably not amused at all by the hubbub following the visit from the Lord himself, actually. Think about it. And the nephew's sovereign disclosure of the conspiracy that he gave regarding what was going to happen to his life, they wanted to stuff him out. He could have traveled unarmed, really, think about it, to Caesarea without incident or even a scratch if God had been on his side. And the last time I checked, God was on his side. God is still God. And God said he was going to speak the good news in Rome. So we either have to believe that God is still who he is, or he's not God. Because God said he was going to go to Rome. He had needed him there to preach the good news, to speak to mankind regarding salvation he had a mission for saul to to quest and to achieve that being said saul could have just walked his way all the way there and would have been under the guiding protection hand of god now however until he had this particular prisoner safely out of jerusalem and where he was going which is ultimately caesarea the roman commander definitely would feel at ease once he get him there, because he didn't want this Roman citizen, you know, to be plaguing him in his commanding role in his officer's uh, position. What's amazing is that Saul was killed by a group of murderous sea lots, you know, really, who would still have known about it and would have justified it if they got away with it. How are the religious people motivated? What fuels the religious spirits and their fire? 
anything that doesn't concur with it carry out its orders or respect to its supremacy and authority, religion wants to be in control and will do whatever it can to achieve that goal and that agenda. They want it their way. And what's so amazing is that they would have sought the murder of Saul and killed him and justified it, would even though somewhere in scripture it says thou shalt not kill but they would have justified it the captain dispatched saul to caesarea which was about 60 miles to the northwest and rather than sending him back to the jewish council the roman administration for the region was based in by the way caesarea and while the jewish government was based in jerusalem but saul using his rights as a roman citizen started a legal process which would proceed there before the Roman court in Caesarea. Now I have to explain how we can learn to find and recognize something that I am ready to guess is most of us have not really seen it and not really understood it, but maybe you've seen it, didn't understand it. There's something that's going on here in, in Saul's life that happens in our lives, yet we don't really recognize it. I want to briefly discuss something that's that's peculiar about God, and that's his sovereignty. God operates in interesting and entertaining ways. God could have transported Saul to Caesarea. He could have used any, any means he wanted to, any, any endless number of strategies. God could have achieved his goal to get in Saul to Caesarea and to Rome, ultimately. He did, however, decide to employ the Roman troops. Think about it. God used something that was not really in Saul's mind that he was going to use, but God did it his way. God's ways are without a doubt superior to ours. God's ways are unrestricted in comparison to ours. Never should we ask God to accomplish something in a way that limits him. Let me say that again. We should never ask God to accomplish anything in our lives in ways that limits him. You can only do it this way, God. You can only do it that way, God. I, I want this to be done this way, God. Sure, anything can happen when God steps in. Absolutely. But God's omnipotence will determine what occurs. God's will is going to be carried out on the earth as it already is carried out in the eternal. It is not that anything will happen when God gets involved, but rather that what God wills to happen will happen, as if he wasn't involved with it to begin with. <laughs> like he's really not in your life at all at any time. He's some Like sometimes he lets you just, you know, straddle on your own sometimes. God never leaves you. God never forsakes you. That's a, everyone of y'all should have said amen right there. Then, yeah. there, there, there are, there are a lot more than we can possibly imagine. The things that God would do, and much better. On top of that, we need to learn to allow God to astound us with His inexhaustible strength, the the inventiveness that God and His plans procure. We need to quit trying to put blinders on our own eyes expecting God to work in certain avenues, in certain ways, and let God be who he is, and that's simply God, because he's God and we are not. Amen? Verse 25 and 26 says, And he wrote a letter having this form, Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. Mm. Felix, a Roman official who served as Judea's governor or procreator, from 52 to 59 AD, 52 to 60, somewhere in there, held the same office as Pontius Pilate, but only in a different country. Where the, in Pontius Pilate, it was Jerusalem, and as far as uh, Felix is concerned, it's going to be over in Caesarea. It's still the land of Judea. The governor oversaw the troops, he maintained the peace, and collected the taxes, while the Jews were given a great deal of autonomy, by the way. Now, how did Luke come to know what was contained 
in Claudius Lysias' letter. Now, you're asking the question, who is Claudius Lysias? Up to this point, you haven't heard his name. All of a sudden, now you get his name. Luke was concerned, by the way, with historical authenticity. And, and we can see this in what he wrote in his gospel. Luke employed a variety of sources to ensure that his writings were accurate. We can go back to Luke or chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and read it ourselves. In fact, if I could get one of you guys, Frank, would you grab Luke chapter 1 for us, please? And we're going to read it in just a second. You see, when Saul appeared before Felix to defend himself against the Jews' charges, this letter was almost certainly read out loud in that court. Now, Luke, not a companion, if you will, while he rode with Saul, but it's assuredly that Luke is there. Saul may have received a copy as a courtesy as well, because he was a Roman citizen after all, but Luke maintained the gesture that he always stayed accurate to what he would say. You got Luke chapter 1, 1 through 4 for us, brother? Just a minute. Yes, I, I've got just about. Let's All right. See. Okay. Luke chapter 1. Verses 1 through 4. Yes, sir. You and this hear the, what yep, said. Go ahead. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, mm. most honorable mm. Theophilus. So, so go ahead. You can be because you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Right. So obviously Luke employed a lot of different things to to prove what he was saying was true. In other words, Luke is saying, I have got enough witness and estimates. I have enough testimony and eyewitnesses. I have enough written, uh, accurate accounts of everything that I'm saying to back up what I'm telling you. That. It's true. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Now, as he being saw a, a Roman citizen, and mm -hmm. he himself would have been uh, privy to probably having a letter of this as well. But however the case may have been, Luke had a copy of it. He included it in his letter to Theophilus. By the way, the former name for the letter is called an elog elegium. This former letter lays forth the prosecution's case for the defendant in writing. Luke's use of the phrase to this effect, which literally is saying after this form in Greek, suggests that this is a merely an accurate description of the letter's contents rather than a word-for-word -word transcription, okay? So basically this elegium is a, is a, is a, uh, a verbiage of accuracy, what he said, not word for word, but it literally means after this, after that right there, after that, that form, after that letter, that what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to basically summarize what that letter said. Now there's another style of address used back then for notable people, which is also his excellency, which by the way, Claudius Lysias refers to him as. Even though we have been reading Luke's report about Claudius Lysias for some time, this is the commander, and this is who's writing this letter. The commander that's referred to as the commander all through the conversation that Luke has been writing to us never gave his name until he presents this letter. It's important to note that God allows your name to be brought into scripture. There is a reason for it. Now, the commander that now we know is Claudius Lysias, his complete name, is only mentioned here, by the way, for the first time and the only time. He is unmistakably a Greek and most likely 
belongs to that ethnic group. Because Claudius was also the name of the emperor at the time, that's the name, Emperor Claudius, it was probably added to him when he acquired his Roman citizenship. And remember, Claudius Lysias bought his citizenship. Remember, he referenced that to Paul. Verse 27 and 30 says, When this man was arrested by the Jews and was about to be slain by them, I came up to them with the troops and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman, and wanting to ascertain the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council, and I found him to be accused over questions about their law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once also instructing his accusers to bring charges against him before you. Hmm. Well, this sounds, I mean, when I, when, the, when I was preparing this lesson, the first thing that came to my mind was Michael Whitlow when I got to this part. I got to this, I said Michael Whitlow's name, I don't know how many times, over and over and over again. And the reason why I did so is because he's got this little slogan, he says, the gift of gab. Now, if there was ever a time that you could ever talk about the gift of gab in scripture, well, Michael Whitlow, right here it is. You couldn't get more plainer gift of gab than this right here. This, this is, he is puffing things up. He is smoothing things out. He is, he is knocking off the rough edges. I mean, he is really pouring on the steam. Um, this letter from a subordinate commander, a commander, Claudius Lysias, to his superior, has the appearance of a formal account of the events and precise phrasing to Felix, the governor of Judea. It should be noted, by the way, that the commander skillfully changed the sequence of events in his opening lines. <laughs> he did. He omitted the fact that Saul was already chained and about to be flogged when the news of his Roman citizenship was revealed. Remember that? Yeah. Uh -huh. What a clever cover-up this guy did. Or as we would like to say in our day and age, how to cover your tail. <laughs> did you happen to also note that Claudius is another accuser of the gospel messengers who entirely cleared Saul? A point Luke, I believe, wished to emphasize in this account. Ephesus mayor Gallio, remember this, had also engaged in that same similar behavior before Felix, the Pharisees was unable to refute Saul. In the chapters that we're going to see ahead of us, we're going to see how Festus and Agrippa would also find Saul innocent. We'll get to that soon. Here, Claudius Lysias claimed that Saul had been accused of no crime worthy of death or incarceration. These would likely serve as a source of inspiration later on, a precedent that Theophilus would be even used later on, we see in church history as you study ahead. And the other early Acts readers we see throughout the early church history who would utilize this portion of Saul's life in their own conflicts with the Jews and the Romans. This serves as a premier precedent for what they used to protect themselves. There is so much here on the church history. I don't have I don't have time tonight to go into it, but I want to just point this out that this becomes a real serious precedent for Christians to be able to use in that part of the world because Rome is the head dog that hunts. Okay? All right. The plot is described, by the way, in Claudius's final remark, along with his decision to send Saul to Caesarea, where he safely could get there and, and more easily be guaranteed a rightful trial. But this is all politics. This is truly the gift of Gab. Sis, verses 31 to 32. So the soldiers, in accordance with their orders, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. But the next day, leaving the horsemen to go on with him, they returned to the barracks. I am so grateful that you're the one who got that word right. I, <laughs> I tell you, 
I know why you took them. It appears that the soldiers were obliged to march hmm? that night, or were they being instructed? Covering the more than 35 mile distance to Antipatris on horseback, the prisoner would unquestionably be secure from pursuers at that distance from Jerusalem at that speed at that time. The soldiers would have been free to return to Jerusalem at that point, leaving Saul to travel the remaining 30, 25 miles or so to Caesarea with the 70 mounted troops. The greater contingent probably went so far before turning back because the final few miles into Antipatris offered suitable terrain for an ambush. So there are a lot of reasons why they probably could turn back. But the main thing is, is that they got halfway there. Uh, verse 33 and 35, sir, ma'am. When these had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. When he had read it, he asked from what province he was. And when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing after your accusers arrive also giving orders for him to be kept in Herod's Praetorium. Mm -hmm. And so Saul and his Roman escort arrived in Caesarea and were presented to Governor Felix. The governor ascertained Saul's province, which was Cilicia, and agreed to hear the case when his accusers arrived. In other words, I'm not just going to listen to it now. I'm going to wait till the boys get here. Felix was the governor of Judea, like I said before, holding the very same position that Pontius Pilate had served in, yet at the time of during the time of Christ. Felix had also, by the way, married Drusilla. Let me talk about Felix a little bit more deeper here. Um, you can go back to Acts 24, 24 and read for yourself where he, you know, he married Drusilla. He's a sister, but she is a, a, um, a sister of Herod Agrippa II. And the Agrippa made mention of in chapter 25 is the same one. He would be considered a man of low birth, by the way, Felix was. Yet he rose to power through the influence of his well-connected brother, Pallas, and his political expedient marriages, by the way. Now, listen, <laughs> you want to talk about connections. Check this out. Felix also married the granddaughter of Antony and Cleopatra. The historian Tacitus, however, described Felix's career with a stinging epigram. He said, he exercised the power of a king with the mind of a slave. Listen to what that historian just said about Felix. He was able to exercise the authority, the power of a king, but his mind, slave to something, but it wasn't kingly. The opposite of a king is a slave. In other words, he's saying that his mind, his, his power and everything that he operated was, was not the same as his mind. In other words, he operated and talked a good game, but he had the gift of gab. <laughs> Once again, everybody seems to have it. Michael, I just, you, I just, your name just kept coming up to me all throughout me pre preparing this study. He was regarded, Felix was, as a poor governor dispensed justice arbitrarily and served his own ends. Jewish revolts increased under his administration. Thus the platform was set for Saul to speak before the leading rulers of that area. When God has a willing person, there will be no end to the places he or she can be used or be taken with phenomenal opportunities for effective work. The gospel was spreading by the sure sovereign hand of God through his trustworthy servant. Saul had a testimony and gave it before the group of governors. We're going to find this through chapters 24 through 26. This was yet another step in God achieving the plan he had for Saul. Destination, by the way, Rome. This journey was not at the expense of the church of Antioch either. It wasn't the believer's purse that was paying for this. The earnings from Saul's tent making didn't cover the charges, but rather the government of Rome paid and flipped the bill. God has his ways, 
and they are always higher than ours. When we get involved in God's business, taking care of the work that he has for us to do, we can expect some of the divine and sovereign benefits that come our way. If we take care of God's business, he will take care of your business. Amen, Frank? Amen. Here we can see God's presence in verse 11. He came and visited Paul. We can see how God knows how much we can take and how deep we can sink. When we are doing God's work, we can expect God to be standing right beside us. We can also see God's protection as in verses 12 through 32. He preserved his children for the work that he has planned for us to complete in that we he will keep us safe until it comes time for him to bring us home you can guarantee god's protection in your life he will preserve you and verses 33 and 30 through 35 we can also see here god's platform god will open the doors that he wills to open and will close the doors that he chooses to close God gives us all the time new opportunities to share good news in strategic and unique situations. If we would take the time to watch and pray, seek and find, taste and see, and recognize the reality of where God is, we will be at risk more than ever than you could even possibly think or imagine. Amen? Frank? Yes, sir. I can tell you, this was some stuff. Uh, 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 uh. I, I just sit back here and I listened and I was just like a piece of piece of bread, but I'm like a biscuit, sopping mm -hmm. it up. Mm -hmm. Can't say sopping it up because <laughs> it got gooder mm -hmm. and gooder uh -huh. and gooder. And gooder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and gooder. Yeah, it did. Anyway, <clears throat> I like the way you explained it. It couldn't have gotten no better than that. But when, <clears throat> when I heard you talk about Paul mentioning that he was a Roman citizen, mm -hmm. I have to go back to Paul's beginning, or Shoes beginning. He was he had dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. First of all, he was a Roman, because his father was. His mother was Jewish. Mm -hmm. That was a smart move, and God was the only one that could, that could orchestrate that that far ahead, yeah. because he knew what was going to come down. So therefore, when they laid hands on Shul or on Paul, mm -hmm. and Paul said in the Roman language, I'm a Roman. The man said, what? What'd you say? <laughs> you know, uh you well, I love I, I love the way he I love the way Saul put it to him. Is it really lawful for you to whoop on a Roman citizen without yeah, a trial? It, it's really lawful. <laughs> and what you say? Yeah. Uh, man, say, uh, you speak my language? That's he right. I'm a Roman. Hmm. Oh, now, this changes the whole complex. Oh, yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah, see? Now, <laughs> that's like uh, uh, on the cat, like going to Chevrolet trying to buy a part. What are you trying to buy? <laughs> I'm trying to buy this door handle. What kind of car you got? I got a Cadillac. Oh, we got to go to the other book mm. to find the bar. <laughs> so, uh, all that. And yes, it took seven, it, it took 400 uh, soldiers, and they were glad to escort him all the way up there and come back. I believe they needed exercise. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, that's certainly one way to put it. <laughs> I believe they might they might have might have wanna go for a nice long night walk mm. and get to get the kinks out and 
stretch their legs and whatever. So <laughs> with that said, Judy say something, yeah. Something. Okay. I hear you. I hear you, Judy. You got nothing to do with it. <laughs> Uh, she's been hanging around. She's been hanging around half cast too long. Yep, I just put him outside. Um, it's interesting to see how God works. Sure. Throughout Acts, um, but also in my own life, um, he's done some pretty amazing things, and. I had no hand in it. <clears throat> so I understand how he uses situations and people and and what have you for his purpose. And I, I, I just love that. <clears throat> um, it makes me feel more accepting of what's going on around me because I realize it's all under God's control <laughs> and I can rely on that. Um, and I liked what you said about a willing person. If, if you're, if you're a willing person, there's no end to what God can do with you. True. And I like that. So I, I there's a lot of interesting stuff in here and the history was interesting. I have to say, John, when you present history, it has no, no, um, it doesn't look like any history lessons I've ever had before. Thank God, because when I got out of history class, I completely forgot what I learned. <laughs> it wasn't important. <laughs> But I see where history is important, and 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 that's been a big lesson for me. Mm. But thank you for the lesson tonight. I appreciate it. Yeah, man, sis. You're welcome. It was on time. I wouldn't know. I'm sitting here. You got an I can't help it yet? Oh, well, I haven't got there yet. <laughs> There's a whole lot going on. Mm. Keep on pushing. Keep on reaching. You get that. Oh, yeah. I um, uh, I just wrote down a few things. I mean, wow. This was uh, was interesting. You know, just like John says, he had to go back on me. I had to go back on him. And when I wrote this down. These two things down. And then that's when it started with me. Because he had just said gift to Gab after I just wrote gift to Gab. <laughs> <laughs> because I could see it. I could see it, but I wasn't looking for John to say it. I was looking for me to read it off of my notes. But he messed me all up there. He just he just got me and slammed me up against the wall. I'm still trying to figure out how to get out the plaster. <laughs> In this thing, when he started off, I wrote down here, why do we try to put God in a box? Hmm. Why are we always trying to put him in a box? Hmm. He ain't gonna stay there anyway. He's too big to be in the box in the first place. <laughs> but we don't have no box big enough to put him in. But then I turned around and I thought about yesterday. Luke did not put in place speculations. He didn't. He was straight to the point. He was he had all the evidence in the world and I was using the word we used the other day. Speculations. He did not form a speculation or an opinion or theory without evidence. He had evidence for all that stuff. And I have 
I had written this all down before you even said it. And then I wrote down gift to gab, and then you started off with gift to gab. So I just sit there and said, oh my goodness. This reminds me of how to I deal with those kids. I'm at a school where you got a lot of mental challenges. And these kids are very smart. They're very smart, but they slow too. Mm. You don't go to them in a political way, or you don't go to them in, in God's way, you lose them. They'll tell you what to do instead of telling them what to do. I know that there's something on the other side of through. Amen. And we got to go through that just to understand. I can understand Paul. Saul. I can see him reading the last part of the 27th Psalms. 14th verse. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He will strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Man waited, and the Lord took care of him. How can we do the same thing? Mm -hmm. I thank God for these classes mm -hmm. because just these little quotes just like you said John gift to gab I see it all the time in the pulpit they lose their spot so they throw a little, a little gab in there and change the whole scenario around but when you go read it you find out well wait a minute why he say that don't go ask him. Something might, something might come out of his mouth besides Christianity. But this is interesting. This is truly interesting. And you know, Michael, after all that's been said and done, oh, taste and see mm, that, that the Lord, Lord is good. Yes, Amen. sir. Yes, sir. Amen. I'm through. <laughs> Y'all got me. I'm, I'm up already getting ready to drink some buttermilk. Oh boy. Okay. You can help yourself with that. <laughs> uh, uh, that's so funny. Got any cornbread and onions to put in it? Oh, oh my. Now we're, oh, no. No. <laughs> oh, now we're, we're talking good now. Yeah. You can sit there. I got somebody on my side now. <laughs> and I, I stir up, I stir fry them onions for you. <laughs> well, I think this has been gratifying. It's been satisfying, and it got gooder and gooder and gooder. And gooder. And gooder. Yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah, see, y'all thought, thought I forgot one. Two. No, I didn't. He got gooder, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, be but before, tell you, we, before we pray out, yeah, go ahead, Frank. Go ahead. Because anytime I got to drinking my coffee and I got the nothing going on yet, well, whatever I had had before that coffee must have been all right. Mm. Tell me. Yes, sir. Come out there and smack rock bottom and come on up there. But that's all right. I, I want to. I want to. Uh, before tonight, this is a. Uh, this is a very. Um, mm, this is a very sobering statement I'm about to make, but it's. Uh, I think it's necessary for those of you who watch on, watch me online and on Facebook or listen to my post. Um, today marks a very serious point in in my life one of one of the one of the men in my life who well 
Ken Holloway was probably one of the greatest guys who ever taught me how to interact with people. Mm. If it wasn't for Ken Holloway, I wouldn't be able to be in front of you. If it wasn't for this man who was a DJ at WSDQ in Chattanooga, um, he later was uh, on DBDOD in Chattanooga. These were two big uh, stations in our area. But he also worked at Sears and he worked at a, a hardware store. But um, he went to, to be with the Lord today. Uh, don't know when exactly. But um, he, this man, he was the main guy over what I think something up on Signal Mountain up here. It was called the Mountain Opry. And it's where people came together every Friday night to play bluegrass music every Friday night and it was every week for years and years and Ken Holloway was one of the men that started that and then at the before the thing ended before COVID took it out um he was standing strong if there was only 25 people in the audience they would have had they would have had the, the mountain offering and he would perform for as many bands that would show up they would play and let them play and um Nobody got paid nothing, but nobody got charged anything either. They passed a bucket around sometime during the night to allow you to want to help pay for the lot bill, help you to pay for the water bill, and they did that. And but that place, and in the springtime and the summertime, as as a young man growing up playing instruments, you know he was one of the main guys who taught me how to get in front of an audience and how to interact with them. And I want to give honor to that man tonight for 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 him and his gift that he was pray for him and his family he's definitely in glory and he's he's uh, up there right now playing music for the king so i just want to give honor and 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 uh, and, uh, and my respect to that man ken holloway passed away today amen well we are glad that the Lord presented you to him because what a gift. Mm -hmm. What a gift. Don, you're a blessed man. Yes, sir, I am. You're a gifted man. You're a powerful man. And you're God's man. It, sure. it don't get no greater than that. Mm -hmm. It's no, it's no greater than that. Michael, take us out of here. Father, thank you. Every lesson that we go through, something's in there for me. Something's in there for you. Something's in there for all of us. The building that we go into, we come together. The Bible says gather. It says unify. And I say it come make you come closer together. When you don't know those things, how do you know God? Because he said if two or three are gathered together in his name, he shall be one in the midst. But if we touch the three, everything will be done. So, Father, we touching and agreeing right now that you are God. You put yourself there to show somebody who doesn't know you for the free part of their sin that they might cry. I yield, I yield. What must I do to be saved? Father, I thank you 
that you gave us a word. You gave us a scripture. You gave us a heart. You gave us a mind to come together, to be able to set this witness on a pedestal, a silver pedestal. Send it to you that you may take it, nourish it, prepare it, that you might show its face and see the glow on its face. It's something about the name Jesus. I don't care how close you get. I don't care what you do. When you're around this, this man named Jesus, there's no way you can be alone. So, Father, go into our homes. Come with us. We're going to open the this door. This guy right here. We're going to open the door for you to come on in. And Father, when you get there, you want to be able to put something on the table just to serve you. So Father, build, build, a, build a fence around us and, 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 and give us strength to be able to take care of one another. That when we come together the next time, we'll be able to say thank you, Jesus, one more time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And just before John play us out, let me close you up with this. For every mountain that you brought me over, for every trial, that you've seen me through for every blessing. Hallelujah. For this, I give you praise. For this, I give you praise. Pass out there. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take you to a, a live thing from the Mountain Opry many, many years ago. And uh, just kind of give you an idea of what we used to go through every week. So I hope you enjoy this. This ain't very much uh, a lot of Christian stuff going on, do that, uh, but it is. But it is my heritage. So let me at least share this if I could, please. Yes, sir. Uh... Now, just so you guys know, that's the Mountain Opry that I was telling you about. That's where I spent all the years of my early childhood, going up till I was in my 30s and 40s, and uh, still going up there and, and listen to it. I was trying to see if I see a spot with Ken. Ken would usually walk on stage and butt dance for everybody, too. So, oh, I think it's, yep, right there he goes, right there. That's Ken, right back there. You'd always find him up on the stage. He's wearing that red shirt right there. Right back there. There's old Ken right back there in the back. So we...
hope you enjoyed that. I'll, I'll play you one more real quick, just to give you an idea. It wasn't always um, uh, the, the music, but the, this is right here, but the introduction to Ken Holloway. If I can get this going fast I've enough. known for quite a few years now. I've had him on the radio, played a lot of his uh, recordings, tapes, and CDs and things. And uh, he was uh, Officer Randy on the heat of night. I know you've seen him on TV. You may not remember it, but he was there, and the thing he just did on the Hallmark Hall of Fame Theater just back in February, I believe, he was uh, Officer Randy again. He had some real good lines in that show. I, I remember pretty good. <laughs> but anyway, this guy is the closest thing I'll ever be to getting to Hollywood, I guess, but I really enjoyed playing his music over the years, and he's one of the best fiddlers in the country, and uh, comes from a great family, too. I love his mother sitting right down there on the front row. And uh, I'd like for you to make welcome, if you would, to the Mountain Opry stage, Mr. Randall Frank. Right here. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ted. Do we have any fans of In the Heat of the Night out there? Anybody watch the show? Well, a few of you. For those of you who don't watch the show, I'm not Bubba. <laughs> I was with him a lot on the show. We had a lot of fun doing the show down in Covington, Georgia. And had a wonderful time being a part of that show. We're going to play a variety of different things for you tonight. I hope something that we do brings a smile to your face. And that was the introduction to him for this guy, uh, right? The for Ken Holloway. So I hope y'all have a good evening. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow night. By the way, we got um, um, we got a, a video for us to to watch tomorrow night. So. Be be uh, be mindful of that. We're gonna. It's gonna be really really good about the history of Paul and and the, and the time that we're studying him right now. So with that being said, good night everybody. We'll talk to y'all later. Good night. Good night.